the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. We are sitting on the finest hoard of gold coins that I've seen in my lifetime. We have never seen this quality before. This is not a normal supply for us. This is unusual. This is unique. When these particular coins are exhausted, I have no idea where we're going for an encore. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney and Drew Kroll. David, you and Drew are both in Europe right now. You guys have been, what is it, three countries in four days. And, you know, for you, Dave, it's perfectly understandable. You'd rather travel than just about do anything. But, Drew, you don't care much for travel. And you've been to Europe, I think, what, nine times in the last year, haven't you? Well, Kevin, it's actually been 12, but it has been nine or 10 times (laughs) just for this one particular mission. Well, that one particular mission, I know we've talked to you before about, and we're going to talk to you a little bit later about it, because it's very, very interesting, very exciting, given the situation right now, not only with supplies in the gold and silver market, but the current demand. I know that Europe is just really popping as far as physical demand, as well as Asia. But David, I'd like to shift to you quickly and talk about a couple of things that have been happening here over the last few weeks, because they're critical to our understanding of what's going on economically worldwide. And we were in Argentina when the yields on treasuries just dropped dramatically. And what that shows is a massive inflow of money into treasuries. I think that was a response to what was about to be a panicking stock market, wasn't it? Well, you're right. And there's a number of things that I think we need to focus on this week in the commentary. Number one, looking at that interaction between people moving out of stocks and into bonds. We're about a month on from that event, but I think October 15th is going to be remembered as one of the red letter days in the financial markets, not only for 2014, but moving forward, because the kind of volatility that we saw had never, ever been seen before. And some of that has to do with how trading is done today, which is on electronic platforms. And these trading systems, if they're overwhelmed with volume, what you'll find is that the operators hit a kill switch and all of a sudden you have no trading, no prices offered and liquidity dries up. And imagine that liquidity in the U.S. Treasury market drying up and there being an impact in the market. So I think there's an adjustment phase here where investors are saying, what did that mean? What's the significance? Was it just like you know a one-off flash crash where somebody got something triggered, but it's never going to happen again? Well, we had a flash move in the treasury market there on October 15th. And for anyone who's paying attention, it was very, very unsettling. But again, more of that to come. I don't think it was a one-off deal. But two other things bringing us more to current events this week, Japanese QE and the G20 meeting, which ended this week in Brisbane, two very, very important events. Well, it's interesting. Talking about Japanese QE, we know that the Japanese have just announced a quantitative easing program that's larger than the United States had been doing, even at its peak. And so they're trying to thrust themselves out of what was announced yesterday as a new recession in Japan. So it looks like Abenomics and quantitative easing seems to be falling short, Dave. QE is not so easy. You might say Japanese QE is making everyone a little queasy. (laughs) Maybe that's a little rough, but you know, it's not getting the job done. The thought had been that in spite of the inherent risks of monetizing assets, that is printing money and going out and buying those assets in the open marketplace, everyone knows that that is inherently inflationary. But they assume that the economic growth desired was so crucial and so necessary that it was worth taking those risks. So we have an all-in bet to stimulate economic growth. It has not yet worked. And then we have the latest GDP report this week showing a further contraction. And what that implies, Kevin, is a lot more money printing because it's not as if the egos anywhere in the world, let alone in Japan, are ready to acknowledge that it's a failed project from the start. They're simply going to say, we did a little, we should have done a lot more. So what does that mean? It means that the Japanese yen compared to the U.S. dollar probably is going up to 140 as our 
guest Ian McCavity suggested just a few weeks ago. And with that comes a tremendous amount of pressure on the German industrial complex, because again, you're dealing with two strong powerhouse exporting nations, which rely on exported finished products, you know, and these are all high-end goods and they do compete. The Japanese and the Germans do compete. And if the Japanese gain a trade advantage because of a much weaker yen, that puts tremendous amount of pressure on the German industrial complex. So we've got those issues in play. Clearly, Japan is not out of the woods, just announcing this week that they're back in recession. You know, triple dip is what they're afraid of here in Europe. It's just been one long economic bleed out for the Japanese. So yes, more yen printing is on its way. And, you know, if you look at gold in yen terms, it has been an outstanding performer. We're very aware in the United States of weakness in U.S. dollar terms. But if you're a Japanese saver, guess what you see in the gold price? You're going from strength to strength and you want to own the stuff. You certainly don't want to own Japanese yen. So there is that. And then we mentioned the G20 meeting this week. Well, and I wanted to bring that up, David, because I've had clients calling me and their hair is standing on the back of their neck because what they've read is what they think is bail-in. One of the decisions from the G20, and of course, Russell Napier, a friend of yours and a regular guest, wrote about this, that bank deposits have changed their very definition. You know, it used to be you would take money, put it in the bank, and that bank was safe keeping that money for you and paying interest on it. But at the G20, it's been announced that possibly those bank deposits could be used to bail in banks. Now, they didn't use the word bail in, but isn't that what it is, Dave? Well, this is basically a provisional agreement by your top 20 countries in the world to say that a depositor in a bank, in the case that that bank goes under, is no longer in a first position to receive their own money back. In fact, there are other creditors who are more important. If that sounds disturbing, Yes, it should be incredibly disturbing. It makes far more sense to be sitting in your own currency than have your currency sitting in the local bank. Now, obviously, the G20 doesn't have an enforcement power to make sure that each country legislates and gets this done on an equally equivalent basis. So the next year or two, it's very important to watch what happens with various bank regulations. And again, this isn't just the United States or Europe or Australia or Japan. I mean, we're talking about a global move to downgrade the solid nature of a bank deposit. And I can't think of anything more disturbing if I were a banker and was subjected to something like this, you know, where essentially, I mean, I couldn't look one of my depositors in the face and say with any confidence that what you see is what you get. No, quite frankly, you might be second, third, fourth, fifth, as it's been outlined you could be eighth or tenth in line, which does go back to what you were saying, Kevin. It implies that you have basically a bail-in proposition. If the bank begins to founder, your assets are on the hook and can be a part of the solution. And I think that has a radical consequence as we move towards 2016, 2017, 2018, stresses and strains in the financial market. What bureaucrats don't appreciate is that when you set things in motion like this, you are setting the groundwork for not only a small bank run, but a system-wide financial failure, in which case every Tom, Dick, and Harry who has their head screwed on straight and says, I don't want to participate in the bailout, does something else with their money. What happens to the banking system when you run out of depositors? How does a bank make loans if it doesn't have a stable stock of depositor assets? Again, with borrowing short and lending long, that's the nature of banking. But that changes dramatically when you lose a depositor base. And again, this will have to be implemented on a country-by-country basis. We don't know what that will look like in the United States exactly. But this is now something that you have to pay very clear attention to. If you were worried about counterparty risk a la Lehman and AIG and those kinds of risks, now you can dial it back considerably. It's not just being concerned about a derivatives market implosion. It's something as basic as bread and butter deposits at your local bank. And as we see this implemented in the United States, I'm very curious to see if the general public has any response 
frankly, I think they won't even care because they won't even know. But I think those in the know will be very cautious about what they do with their money. And it probably means there's a few more greenbacks going into the mattress, into ounces, basically being pulled from the financial system. Because you may not have been a part of the problem, but if your assets are considered a part of the solution and you're not volunteering for that, well, again, this is where it gets a little bit awkward. The crazy thing is, Dave, we were raised when we get paid, put your money in the bank, earn interest on that money. And that money is not only safe in the bank, but it's insured by another insurance entity like the FDIC. But at this point, there is no interest really to be paid. So, I mean, a lot of people are questioning why they put money in the bank in the first place. But now, with that money being reclassified as something other than just safekeeping, that could be very dangerous. Now, I want to shift gears here, though, because we have seen here recently large fines being paid by banks for manipulating the gold price. And UBS had to pay a couple of billion dollars. Now, that may just be paying to play. They may still continue to manipulate the markets. I don't know. And we're starting to see these manipulations in the market at least being called out. Now, one of the areas that's been accused of possibly falsely pricing the market has been in London for over a 100 years. It's the London fix. And I know that while you guys are there in Europe, there's been a change, I think, this week with the London fix. Would you talk about how gold now is fixed in London? Yeah, the London fix, which, I mean, if you take that as a euphemism in itself, sounds a bit dodgy. But it's basically been changed from an old boys club where the price is set twice daily. Literally, guys gather around a table and determine what the price will be twice daily. You know, obviously, undoubtedly, the bullion banks have been self-dealing in this way for generations. And now they're moving to an automated algorithm. And the London Bullion Metals Association is introducing this as a much more transparent, high-tech process. Now, I don't know if that's actually going to be the case. I mean, transparent and high-tech, that's not axiomatic. You can have high tech and, as you know, from the Blackpool trading on the New York Stock Exchange and the high frequency trading, tech improvement can bring with it new and sundry risks. So we'll have to see exactly how that plays out. But here's what we're hearing on the street as it relates to gold supplies. In essence, gold supplies are drying up. And let's look at this in detail. Number one, you've had lower prices. You know, the last two, three years have delivered lower prices of gold. And what we have now is competitive currency devaluations afoot, and no one really wants to sell their physical metals in mass. So there's no large blocks of gold coming to market by your average physical gold investor. And, you know, we've talked a lot about interest rates. One of the sort of unique things, the gold lease rate, which let's say you've got three tons of gold sitting in a gold vault somewhere. Someone may come along and say, hey, I'd like to borrow that gold from you. I'll give it back in the future. And in the meantime, I'll pay you X percent to borrow your gold. That's the gold lease rate. Well, that rate is scraping the bottom of the barrel. Banks have gotten rid of a lot of their gold because it's no longer profitable for them to loan it out or lease it out. Does that make sense? I mean, we're talking about the miners, the refiners, the jewelry fabricators who always have this expectation of gold inflow and in a short interim period will borrow gold. They need a fairly deep pool of borrowable gold in order to do that. But quite frankly, with rates being so low, and I think this is absolutely fascinating and absolutely ironic, central bank policy has driven rates incredibly low and have basically made this part of the banking business unprofitable. So we can explore this a little bit further, but there's some interesting coincidences as to why we're here right now. You know as well as I do that central banks don't want higher gold prices. It shows what they've been doing in the marketplace. As they print and create inflation, they can cover their tracks in part by keeping a lower gold price. And yet, what they've set in motion with a zero interest rate policy, not only in the United States, but in other parts of the world, zero interest rate policy means virtually zero gold lease rate, means no financial motive to hold the gold. And what's happened is that gold is moving into private hands. 
So the balance of power in the gold market already moved away from central banks earlier in the decade, 2009, 2008, when the preponderance of ownership is now in private versus central bank hands. Now, all of a sudden, you've got bullion banks who are losing control as well as more and more control slips in the direction of a private owner. It seems like an unusual opportunity because supplies are drying up, yet you're seeing these changes in the laws that came from the financial crisis of 2008. It's almost forcing some of these banks to sell a little bit of that gold that they would be leasing. Doesn't that have to do with some of the new capital requirement rules that came about back then? Well, that's exactly right. It's spot on. Following the 2008-2009 financial and banking crisis, we've seen all over the world an expectation of higher capital requirements. Now, if you're looking at gold as an asset on the balance sheet of a bank, and it's not a profitable asset in the sense that they can't generate an income from it, in an environment of higher capital requirements, there's much more of a desire or motive on the part of a bank board to simply scuttle that asset and get rid of it. And so this is what we're finding, again, in an environment with higher capital requirements. This all started five years ago, but this asset now needs to go. Gold needs to go, and it's shifting tonnage from what previously had been unallocated accounts. You might call them claim accounts or what have you. But the gold is unallocated. It's now moving to allocated accounts, and that's having the unintended consequence of squeezing the entire gold industry. I'm not talking about us in the gold industry. I'm talking about the miners, the refiners, and the jewelry makers, because as we mentioned earlier, they need a predictable and deep pool of gold to borrow from, and they're being squeezed. They're being squeezed because now the gold, not in the bank's account, which they can go borrow, it's in a private personal account, and it's no longer available. So this is absolutely a fascinating setup for us, and I think it will set the stage for an explosive move higher in the price of gold. Why do I say that? Because if you look at this huge pool of gold, I mean, there's tons and tons of gold available on Comets today. But as the borrowers of gold, that is, your miners, refiners, and jewelry makers, have to now go to Comex to borrow gold there, as opposed to the banking industry, what that does is it shrinks the available pool of gold that can go into an exchange-traded product like GLD or SLV. And I think as soon as we see $100, $150 move higher in the price of gold, you're going to see investors clamoring to own the metals. They'll click the mouse button to buy GLD and SLV. And there's going to be a mad dash for the available ounces on comics. This sets us up for absolutely explosive pricing. Now, you suggested, what are we doing here in Germany? Well, Germany, Brussels, France, we're here to basically clean up. Why do I say that? And Drew, you can chime in any time. But we were presented with a multiple, you know, couple hundred million dollar deal this last year as an Eastern European bank dumped their gold holdings for all of these reasons. Low lease rates made it uninteresting for them to keep the gold asset on their balance sheet. And they are dumping product to us, which hasn't seen the light of day in 90 to 100 years. And so if there's indiscriminate selling and we can step in and with small premiums buy old quality product at rock bottom prices, I mean, look, we're below 1200 an ounce. This is brilliant. We think it's brilliant as a company. We've backed up the truck and have tried to offer this to clients in a way that is compelling. Why are we here? This is the biggest deal our company has ever been involved in, ever been involved in. And we're very excited about it because it's the right quality product, it's the right size, fractional European, and it's the right price. But Drew, maybe you want to chime in. Absolutely, David. And Kevin, I'm sorry you aren't here to see some of the things that David and I are seeing, but it's sort of a choir over here. We're hearing the same thing from three of the largest dealers in Europe from three different countries, all singing the same chorus saying, you know, there just simply isn't any new real source of this kind of gold available. It was some 13 years ago that our company was involved in a large liquidation that time, primarily being generated from the Bank of England when they were selling coins. But we're looking at almost a unique situation here 13 years later, because one thing that David didn't mention, but I think is very relevant, 
the German broker on this particular deal told us today that had this deal happened only six to nine months later, we very well may not have gotten it just due to new compliance issues. Well, and the compliance issue, this is where the whole banking industry is becoming a bit of a quagmire. And we did talk with Joseph Tainter a few months ago about the collapse of complex societies. You can even look not at a society, but at a system. When you begin to bring in new elements of complexity, you do stress and strain the system as it is. One of the largest banks here in Germany has gone from a compliance department of five to 10 to over 550 compliance officers. And you're right, the deal that we were introduced to and participate in to this day, we would not have had available to us because, again, even in the last 12 months, compliance is chewing up and spitting out anything that looks like good business. And it's just, it's a fascinating thing. I don't know where the banking industry goes or if it survives in its current form. But it does seem like we're moving towards greater and greater complexity, which is not sustainable and ultimately has to be dialed back. To me, again, that spells, where do you want to have your assets? Do you want to have them sitting in a bank waiting for the next bail-in, a la the G20 from Brisbane? More on that to come as it's announced on a country-by-country basis. Or do you want something that is a financial asset but stands outside of the financial system? Well, it might be worth right now for our listeners just to reintroduce Drew Kroll. You know, we've been talking to you, Drew, but the background that you've brought to the McIlvaney Company is long. I mean, 33 years as a numismatist for both Don McIlvaney and now David McIlvaney here at McIlvaney. And you've seen a lot of changes in the industry. You know, there were periods of time when you could buy thousands and thousands of coins. You know, you mentioned the Bank of England those days. It seemed like we had never-ending supply. Now, it did end, and we became very tight on supply of these older, nice, uncirculated, 100-year-old coins. And now you've gotten an opportunity to get them again. But that's really not the nature of what's going on in Europe right now, is it? I mean, aren't the supply lines going from thousands of coins at a time? Most dealers are having to experience purchases of no more than a few hundred. And even in that, Kevin, we're talking about fractional gold coins. We're not even talking about one-ounce coins. We're talking about very small deals trading hands now. You know, it was only a year and a half ago at ICA that David and I and a couple of others sat down in strategy meetings, just looking each other in the eye and say, where are we going to get product for our clients? I mean, you know, it's drying up. We aren't able to meet the demand. Where are we going to find what we need? And we counted a great blessing that this one particular deal came our way. One of the largest dealers in Europe put us on to this and has been brokering this deal that we're extremely excited about getting because it meets all the criteria that we want. They're extraordinarily high-grade coins. They are, as David already mentioned, anywhere from 80 to 100 years old. The quality, the age, the strike, the color, all of it is as if they were just minted yesterday. So these are the kinds of things that we try to find. It isn't just finding a bar of gold or a bullion item to have our investors take a look at. It's really trying to put them in something that is time-tested and probably will be the best way to increase their leverage and the profitability in the times ahead. Drew, you, as you mentioned earlier, have been over here 12 times this year. We have gone as a company to great lengths, and you've been a part of that process, to bring the highest quality product, what we consider to be great value to our clients. Listen, between you and me, we don't need to travel halfway around the world to find any old gold coin for our clients. But this, as you and I have talked about it, this is probably the last great hoard we will ever have as a company. You go back 13 years, yes, the central bank this hoarding, we had the opportunity to buy in large quantities, tens of thousands of coins, and it then became a trickle. And for our clients who were acquiring product in the two and three hundred dollar gold price range, it has been an absolutely fantastic move higher because they track gold dollar for dollar on the upside. Now, again, we've gone from a flood then to a trickle for about 10 years where we can buy hundreds and occasionally a thousand coins here or there. 
this year is so different. We're back to this one singular deal where we've been able to buy tens of thousands of coins. As you say, this is a tremendous blessing because literally it was September, October of last year when you and I had that conversation, looked each other in the eye and said, where are we going to find product? We know exactly where this is going. The gold price will pick up again. And there is very little that is on offer that represents clean, clear, pristine value in the gold market. And here we are. I mean, literally, we had that conversation September, October, and you got the call two, three days before our Christmas party last year saying, get on a plane. And you said, yeah, I'll be there in a couple of weeks. He said, no, you get here tomorrow. If you're interested, get here tomorrow. And again, the last great gold board were surprised by how large it was, but clearly it redounds to the benefit of our clients. You know, I find it interesting, as I know that the two of you do, that given the situation that we've just had where gold has been correcting, as a matter of fact, we've had really, we've reached a 41% correction in gold, that rather than aggressively adding to a position, people get kind of put off by or scared by the fact that gold is dropping. I find that fascinating because it's the only financial instrument that has ever truly survived the test of time, some 6,000 years that we know of, and yet people are running to a fiat paper currency that has never survived the test of time. It just seems so ironic to me that given the opportunity to buy far more gold for the same number of dollars and the fact that we are sitting on the finest hoard of gold coins that I've seen in my lifetime, those two things are just incongruous to me. That was reiterated by the folks that we met with today, again, the finest that they have ever seen, too. So this is two companies, our 40-odd year history, their 40-odd year history in the industry, and we haven't seen anything like this before. Probably won't again. It is interesting because, you know, we mentioned the Brisbane meeting, the G20 meeting, and the reality that the financial system is creating a better mousetrap. We happen to be the mice, and I find that very disconcerting. Well, Drew, in years past, when you've been buying both the Guilders and the British sovereigns, you've found that even if they were uncirculated, a lot of times they were just mixed dates, a lot of different mixed dates. And of course, that happens when a bank has reserves. Those coins are going to get mixed up. But there is something unique about this. You're finding dates all together. What does that indicate, that maybe they were minted together and then immediately put aside as a reserve? Absolutely, Kevin. This is unlike anything I've seen. There are original mint bags of Dutch tin guilders. It is remarkable. 1917, 1926, 1927, uh, 1932, 1933, and I may have missed 1925, but those six dates are all represented in this particular hoard. And for the first and only time, that we've ever been able to do this, we've been able to offer them in solid date rolls, which again, is just a unique opportunity to buy coins just as they were minted with amazing color. The condition is amazing. The strike couldn't be crisper. These are, as the gentleman said today, we're meeting with a group in Germany. He just flat out said, and I reiterate the same thought, and it's just, we have never seen this quality before on a 80 to 100 year old coin. You know, David, simply put, um, when we have product that you and I kind of compete for in the office, <laughs> I, I think that really speaks as strongly as anything else I can say to our, our listeners. These are coins that you and I personally own, we have personally bought. We would never make a suggestion to anybody to buy something that we wouldn't personally own. But when you and I start competing for them, they should know that this is really something very special. Well, and I even like the fact that gold is, as you mentioned, in a corrective stage, which I think, frankly, is over. We've broken below 1180. And guess what? We've recovered back above it very quickly. And that's a very positive indicator. Getting above 1180 that's positive. Getting above 1,200, that'll be positive. Getting above 1,240, that'll be positive. 1,340, these are all sort of signs of progress as we move into the next stage of growth for gold. If you're looking at the long-term charts on gold, that is your monthly chart, as and when that turns up, you're talking about 18 to 24 months of an up cycle. 
And I think we go well above the 1500 mark in that cycle, as high as 21, maybe even $3,000 an ounce, but at least to 2100 on that 18 to 24 month cycle. So quality of product, plenty of it, ideal pricing. I think if you could say right time, right place, right product, it does kind of line up that way. Well, David, again, just to reiterate one more time, this is not a normal supply for us. This is unusual. This is nearly unique. When these particular coins are exhausted, I have no idea where we're going for an encore. So again, it is a unique opportunity. Gold is on sale. These coins couldn't be nicer or more dynamic. So it's a convergence of all things. It's sort of the perfect storm when it comes to being able to buy this kind of product at this kind of price. Well, this is just kind of a high-level overview of what we've been working on for 12 months and the lengths to which we will go to deliver value to our clients. You know, if somebody's interested, you can obviously find more information on our website or call our office and get further details. Dutch Guilders, British Sovereigns, the European fractionals have been a game changer for our clients for over 10 years. And the fact that we have this one last great hoard, we are excited about it. As you say, Drew, I don't know what we're going to do for an encore, but <laughs> we'll just we'll take that as it comes. The world is a changing place. It's a very rapidly changing place. And I think very keen decisions need to be made over the next 6, 12, 18 months that account for resources and plan for generations to come. Because again, I don't believe that the financial system is being engineered today to take care of us. I think it's been designed to extract value from us. And to ignore that is to do so at your peril. To be aware of an out, if you will, from the system has probably never been more important. And owning gold represents that out. It gives you freedom, flexibility, and autonomy. And it's very interesting to me, as we mentioned, Kevin, a few weeks ago, this sort of reconversion experience with Alan Greenspan. It was years ago that he would say gold and financial freedom are inseparable. If you remember that, that was his theme when he was sort of an Ayn Rand acolyte. Well, listen, he's coming back around to that. Gold and financial freedom are inseparable. And I ask that question as we close, do you value your financial freedom? Do you value your financial integrity? It's time to put a plan together for that right now. We've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck, along with David McIlvaney in Europe and our longtime numismatist, Drew Kroll. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, and give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.